We've been fighting a long time. We have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela Dei Mater Alma Ad Fe Semper Virgo Felix Teli Porta Sumersi Loda Me Everybody, it's Steve with Sense of Belly. I'm coming at you on the 22nd of March, 2020, with Father Gordon of the Priestly Fraternity of St. Peter, Father Dennis Gordon, because there's three of them. Right. So, Father, how you doing? Doing well, doing, doing well. well. Good, doing to well. Good to see you. Same here, same here. Thank you for coming on. And in this time of, uh, I guess you say, uh, uncertainty or difference that we are in right now, you guys are coming up with online streaming for multiple things. Can you tell us why you thought about doing this and what they are? Yes, yeah, so we, uh, just like every other diocese in the country, uh, have found ourselves under the same restrictions that everyone else has. And uh, we definitely wanted to have people still connected with the Holy Mass, still be able to preach to people, still be able to have catechism, Bible studies. So we're, we're continuing that with uh, with some live streaming, so we just uh, we just got that set up pretty recently. Very good, very good. Um, are you also doing catechism classes and Bible studies? Is that what I hear? That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I thought uh, Travis was telling me about this. He goes, "Is that okay if we can do that?" I go, "You do not know how many people have asked for that, uh, <laughs> begging for stuff like that." So, right. God, everyone's thinking, <laughs> obvious for the priest for doing this. God bless them for doing it. Uh, thank you. Um, you're welcome. You're welcome. So. Other than turning on and turning on and watching the programs, what else can they do? Because we got people coming onto the website, obviously, and watch sermons. They grow. They got books on my website that they can read for free. What else they can do spiritually to grow during this time? Well, yes. First of all, I think it's important for people to uh, to see why this is happening, and I don't mean on the natural level, right? You know, the natural level. They okay. There's this pandemic, people are reacting to it, maybe overreacting to it. Uh, but I think it would be foolish not to see the hand of God in the, the whole nation and other parts of the world uh, being under the same um, suspension of public mass. And to not see the hand of God in that is really not to see how God has worked in the past. Um, you recall uh, at Mount Sinai um, in Exodus 24, the whole congregation of Israel, which at that time was the, the church, right, the Old Testament, they were brought to Mount Sinai. They had an encounter with God. They worshiped Almighty God on Mount Sinai in Exodus 24. They made a covenant with him. Um, God was present. They were present at the offering. And what happened? Remember, Moses told them to prepare, and they didn't quite prepare. So they said, Moses, you go up the mountain. And part of their preparation was, he said, stay away from your wives, right? So they, they didn't follow that. They couldn't restrain themselves with regards to purity. And so they weren't ready to see God. And then that led to the further impurity of uh, after this covenant, when Moses went up to be with God for 40 days, they fell into the golden calf debacle. And so they were left in a situation now. Um, when Moses came down the mountain, he took the tabernacle out of the camp. And so Moses would go and meet with Almighty God. God would come down in the pillar of cloud. And the people, as it says in uh, Exodus 33, they would stand at the door of their own tents. So they weren't allowed to go up to the tabernacle anymore. And uh, we see this pattern kind of shows up again where um, when the people sin, God sort of takes away. The, the, the sacrifice from him. He takes away 
uh, their, their worship in a certain sense, you know, even so far as the Babylonian captivity. So I, I don't know if this is our own personal sin or it's the sin of the world, or maybe, you know, we haven't done things, but we need to make the atonement for it. And so this is what's happened, at least publicly, we have uh, that sacrifice been taken away from us. So if we can see that, if we see, all right, there's, God is allowing this for some reason, um, if not actually trying to punish us or wake us up, and then that will make us more willing to make the atonement and sanctify ourselves, right? And then so now that leads to what we can do spiritually to grow in this time. Well, then we can next look at the example of the saints that went for many years without Holy Mass, right? St. Gerard Magella went for a number of months where he could not receive Holy Communion. Uh, St. Mary of Egypt went out into the desert uh, to be with our Lord. She didn't have the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Um, you know, uh, St. Zosimus would come out and give her Holy Communion, and when he couldn't uh, get to her because the banks of the River Jordan were swollen, she walked across the water to receive our Blessed Lord. Uh, that's how eager she was to to be united to our Lord. But nonetheless, she normally was not with, that, with the, the presence of the, and the consolation of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Then you had St. Padre Pio, who also was, for a time, he could not offer uh, Mass publicly for years. He willingly submitted to that and uh, was really sanctified by that tremendous trial. St. Isaac Job, for a number of uh, years, you know, could not offer Holy Mass. So he was a captive and St. Damien of Molokai as well. So we have a number of saints that entered into private prayer, personal prayer. That's where they really sanctified themselves is when they learned meditation, contemplation. And that's, I think, how we can grow spiritually is really learning now how to meditate and be alone with our Lord in a personal prayer. Yeah, I was doing uh, some research. I did a podcast a couple of week ago, a week ago or so. And, uh, I didn't know about the plague of Malta because I was doing uh, Saints of the Plague and St. George got popping up. How is St. George part of this? And, uh, way they, like 8,000 people, eight or 11,000 people died on, on the island of Malta during this time. But they said, like how you were saying, it was, they, they looked at it as punishment for their sins and a great devotion to the Eucharist came out of it again. So I'm hoping something like that happens. Anyway, uh, so what... Um, Ideas to keep discipline. I know from my side, my side even just non-religious wise, uh, I had a schedule, getting up at X time, start my morning prayers, go work out, uh, et cetera, work. And some of this is all topsy-turvy now, so you get everyone's getting out of a habit. What's a good uh, example or some tips to get people to stay disciplined in the faith so they don't get out of any bad, creating bad habits? Yes, exactly. Well, we need elements of uh, every aspect. We need elements of the moral life, so discipline with regards to some vice that we're trying to conquer, some virtue we're trying to gain. So we need discipline in that area. We need discipline with regards to our prayer life. So we need to have a good prayer regimen, uh, a regular prayer schedule. We also need uh, good spiritual reading to supplement our meditations, to supplement uh, material for our meditation. Uh, and then time alone with Almighty God. Uh, we also need works of charity. I mean, this is actually a good time for us to to kind of take care of the elderly, the ones who are maybe, maybe they're more afraid to go out there and, you know, get sick or something. So we can, uh, you know, supplement that as well. So uh, in these ways, we can, we're sort of doing those, those three aspects of Lent, you know, prayer, almsgiving, you know, fasting, right, penance. So um, if we can find different ways. So uh, having a good, a good schedule, I think it's important that every Catholic um, make the acts of faith, hope, and charity every day. So whether you make that in the morning or the evening, that should be a part of every Catholic's uh, prayer routine. Uh, offering up as well the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed every day. Um, this is something that St. Vincent Ferrer uh, advised people to pray every day, the Nicene Creed, to strengthen their faith. In that time um, during the Great Western Schism, that um, people were so confused, we're at confusing times today as well. And he said, Pray the Nicene Creed every day. And that's something our Lord even warned us about. He said, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? And so we need to augment our faith. We need to make acts of faith, and uh, especially that um, the profession of, uh, of faith, the, the Nicene Creed. And then as well, uh, of course, the, the, the standard staples that every Catholic should be doing, the daily rosary, um, but also spiritual reading. Uh, a lot of Catholics drop that off. That seems to be something that 
maybe they drop off first, they let go of first, but that's really going to keep the fires of hope in us alive is if we have good spiritual reading. You know, if we stop remembering that there's a heaven of beauty that awaits us above the whole mess of this world, uh, we're going to start losing hope. If we do good spiritual reading, if we see the examples of the lives of the saints, if we get good motivational uh, devotional reading, uh, you know, booklets like uh, Uniformity with the Will of God by St. Alphonsus Liguori, How to Converse with God by uh, St. Alphonsus as well, uh, The Book of Confidence by Father Laurent, um, other books as well. There's uh, uh, Jesus, Our Eucharistic Love by Father Manelli. A uh, number of things that we can we can do like that to help motivate us. Even the, the spiritual exercises, uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola has some very good um, steps on how to make a meditation. Some people don't really know how to make a meditation. There's an Ignatian way of doing that in the spiritual exercises. Um, there's a good uh, uh, translation of those exercises by Father Pohl, uh, P-U-A-H-L. And that's a good version of the uh, spiritual exercises. So you can use that to help form and augment your spiritual life in this time now when you don't have to be, or you're not driving into church for Holy Mass. Um, you can augment that uh, at home. So good spiritual reading, time for meditation, contemplation, uh, time for the Holy Rosary, um, making the, uh, the devotion to the, the three Hail Marys each morning and night for, for purity. These, these will be good things to help souls uh, now that they have. Um, Holy Mass, public Holy Mass, deprived of them. You can also get to a church every day, make a holy hour every day. Uh, it, you know, it, it should be it should be evident to, to Protestants when they drive by a Catholic church that there's a bunch of cars in the parking lot, and they might wonder why are these cars there? Well, they because because they believe our Lord is there. You know, our Lord is their body, blood, soul, and divinity. So if you have adoration, perpetual adoration, or even just the church, our Lord reposed in the tabernacle. Go and visit our blessed Lord, and you'll receive the consolation you need. You, you were actually reading my mind. I you took my next question out because you just you said that. But yeah, the sermon today that that even got me because uh, I mean I've read that book by uh, Father Mueller a couple of times on the Blessed Eucharist, and with Father using that caption of uh, uh, just going, you know, praying towards the tabernacle wherever you are was. Yes. I go, I remember that page. I was like, right, right. I gotta go back and read that book again. But yeah, that was. The, great book and every time i hear a sermon from you guys it's going to be hey there's a book i can you can read from these take it home remember that and educate yourself on that and uh help out the uh, publishers exactly exactly, exactly. <laughs> i have to blame the fraternity for getting all these books for me <laughs> <laughs> um how do we keep from despair as individuals and family uh, uh maybe maybe people aren't used to being at home together a lot or uh, job may be up in question, things like that nature. Right. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, one of the ways is to remember uh, what is happening here. Why, why is God doing this? I, I think one, you know, consider this, Steve, we have, we have really been in the, the, you know, in modern times, we have the most access to the blessed sacrament. We have the most access to Holy mass than in any of the previous centuries. Uh, Pope St. Pius X opened up uh, more uh, early First Holy Communions, you know, earlier on when children are younger. Um, he also encouraged more frequent um, Holy Communion, even daily Holy Communion. It uh, used to be where you'd have to get your confessor's permission first, and so there was a lot of restriction in centuries past. There, there's no, there are not those restrictions today. Uh, we have vehicles, we can drive to a church where the Blessed Sacrament is. It might not have been so in past centuries where people had to walk some distance perhaps to get to the church. And so we've got a lot of ways that we can have access to the Blessed Sacrament and have access to our Lord. And so if our Lord has taken it away for a time, it could be as a curative, as a, as a way to... Uh, to have us increase our longing for our most blessed Lord. Mm -hmm. St. Thomas Aquinas speaks of this in the Summa, where he says, if perhaps we become too complacent in our reception of Holy Communion, if perhaps we've started to take it for granted and we you know, just think, wow, this is it's always going to be there and this is no big deal, or maybe Holy Communion becomes something of just a habit to us. Mm -hmm. A curative that St. Uh, Thomas recommends is abstain for a time. Mm -hmm. So that our longing for the Holy Eucharist can increase. This may be God's 
imposition of abstinence from the Holy Eucharist, from the public offering of the Holy Mass, so that we can have that longing once again return to us. So uh, that's something that we can keep in mind. The, the next thing is, okay, you realize God may be trying to increase our longing for him in the Holy Eucharist. So that's a sign of hope. The next thing is, you know, we've, we're kind of due for something, right? You know, we, we've been going, our country has been really uh, outputting or outsourcing a lot of, uh, a lot of filth, you know, our America really puts out a lot of bad things, right? Uh, we have some good things too, but there's a lot of bad that, that our, uh, our culture uh, puts out. And for years, I was just kind of wondering, when is God going to strike us? You know, maybe some people were thinking, well, maybe, you know, California or New York will just get taken off the map or something. There, people are always kind of expecting like things like that. And, but, you know, this affects the whole world. This affects the whole church. And so it's, it's a real sign of God's mercy that he's actually now disciplining us. It's the parents that don't discipline their children that don't love their children when it really comes down to it. And so our Lord, for many years, it seemed like there was, you know, when is God going to step in? I think God's stepping in and he's giving us a discipline. He's giving us a, a sort of worldwide punishment. And uh, it's a difficult one because it affects our worship. Uh, but it also, also should give us some hope. Okay, God is actually still interested enough that he's disciplining us of course he's interested in us but i think that should give us some hope that you know before something more calamitous you know comes upon us you know like our lord you know would tell those people who he healed go and sin no more lest something worse happen to you right this is a it's a wake-up call and it's not like holy mass has been taken off the face of the earth holy mass is still being offered it's not public in so many places but uh, but at least we, it's it's the wake-up call we're being you know, uh, shaken by our Lord to, to wake up. And so that should be a sign of hope. It should be a sign that, look, God's trying to get our attention. Mm -hmm. He still loves us, right? He really does. So, um, you know, I think uh, we can say, you know what? I didn't know what it was like to be without the Holy Eucharist. You know, St. Joseph never received Holy Communion in his lifetime. St. Joseph was never at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass in his lifetime. Our Lady did not get to receive our Lord in Holy Communion on Good Friday. The first time the body, blood, soul, and divinity was offered in sacrifice to God the Father. Why should I insist that I have that, right? So we can, you know, say, we can realize, okay, God is allowing us to endure some of these things that these saints have had to endure. St. Gerard, St. Isaac Jobes, as I mentioned, St. Padre Pio. Now he's letting us carry some of that burden of the cross. That, that's, a, that's a comfort to me if God is allowing uh, some of that cross to fall upon my shoulders as well. Uh, that is a comfort to me. So I think that can give some people hope. I even think of uh, Saint uh, Saint Therese just popped in my head from the Jansenists. Yes. Uh, when you talk, <laughs> that was our own doing it to us. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, uh, charity wise, you brought up yes, helping out the uh, uh, elderly. We I know there's a group out here that uh, uh, are trying to get to the elderly to, in our parish to deliver groceries or bring them to the grocery store when they have the, uh, was it the times that safe for them, I guess, is what they're doing at some of the stores. Right. Uh, what else for also for, uh, helping out with the parishes and the priests, don't get tithing wise, uh, is, is that we need to crank that up a little bit more too, or don't forget the priests and the parishes because you guys still got bills, right? That's true. That's true. And a lot of uh, a lot of the, the money that we need to keep operating comes through our uh, Sunday collections. And uh, I'm sure a lot of parishes uh, like ours has um, have a kind of a give button on the website. And so at St. Joan of Arc in Post Falls, Idaho, we've got that. Our website um, has its you know resource there. You can you can go online and click and you go to your own parish and, and give. And, you know, so that's I think that's important to, to do to keep uh Keep the church in mind, you know, we, uh, that's uh, one of the six precepts of the church, right? Contribute to the support of the church. And so that still applies, even though there's not uh, public holy sacrifice of the mass being offered. Um, but then also there's the, there's the, the poor and the people who are going to be uh, most immediately economically impacted uh, at our parish. We're we sort of set up a little food bank here where people can uh, drop off food. Um, they can buy food and, and drop it off. And then anyone who uh, wants to can just come by and take what they need. So they don't need to come and ask us. They just they can just go into the parish hall and pick out what they need. And then others who um, are 
uh, a little little better off, they they're they're buying a lot of things in bulk. I don't think they're buying up all the toilet paper and everything, but they're they're uh, they're buying a number of things, uh, you know, food staples in bulk and um, leaving it here at the parish for any of the people as as time goes on and as people get more economically impacted. And also, um, we put out in our bulletin uh, to uh, you know kind of a call for any young people who want to do shopping for the elderly. Um, and also check up on the elderly that, you know, please let us know and we'll get you in contact with someone. Uh, and also we put out a call there for the elderly to, if, if they need anything at all, please let us know. And then we can, we can take care of the shopping for them or, or whatnot. So those are some ways that we can, we can, uh, do some charitable works in this time. Very good. Yeah. Just, uh, just they, and these guys don't have to do what they're doing folks. So please support them. They're still going out doing the sacraments putting themselves in harm's way if there's anything going on in their area. So please say prayers for all the priests, especially the ones helping out, but all of them as well, general. And uh, yeah, Father, you got any uh, final tips or advice? Uh, you know, there is, uh, there's that passage, right, from 2 Paralipomenon, chapter 7, um, verse 13 and 14, where uh, our Lord says, he says, if I send a pestilence among my people, and uh, my people upon whom my name is called being converted shall make supplication to me and shall seek out my face and do penance for their most wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sins and will heal their land. So anytime God sends even a pestilence, which is an epidemic, uh, as he says in the second Paralipomenon Chronicles uh, chapter 7, Anytime he sends that, it's always a call to conversion. And so uh, we know there is a solution. He says, if we do penance for our sins, we call upon the holy name of our Lord. We seek out the face of the Lord. Uh, God will hear us from heaven. He will forgive our sins. He will heal our land. So, uh, so don't give up. Don't be without hope um, in these, these most difficult times where we don't have that consolation, that um, you know, that, that consolation of the physical presence of our Lord being there physically at Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. We can sort of unite to our Blessed Mother as she had that experience of losing our Lord's physical presence for those three days when he was lost in the temple. Um, we can also realize, you know, uh, the church, for whatever reason, is uh, God's allowed the, uh, the, the bishops out of fear to um, make this decision. Uh, in this way, they're sort of living through, or we are, you know, the church, uh, the mystical body of Christ is living through what the physical body of Christ uh, lived through in his passion, uh, including the sort of the, the that moment of uh, fear and hiding of the, the, the first bishops, right? Well, so we're, we've got some decisions that have come to us uh, also out of uh, fear of this virus and um, sort of like those apostles who were hiding in the upper room there out of fear. Um, we're kind of, that's, that's what we're left with now is, is uh, uh, having to participate um, at a distance from the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Those of us priests who are nonetheless privileged to uh, offer Holy Mass every day, uh, we can remember that we, we need to be like uh, St. John, like St. Mary Magdalene, like Our Lady, who were uh, you know, silently there, raising their voice in silent prayer to our most blessed Lord. Um, that's an important response, right? Our Lady could have certainly cried out about the injustices that were going on. St. John could have certainly cried out, that's not just what you're doing to him, you know, and, and that had that kind of response. But their response in the midst of this, uh, of the trial of our Lord, um, in the sacrifice of Calvary, was contemplative, prayerful, and uh, in Our Lady's case, it was co-redeeming, right? So if we unite our sacrifices that we're going through now, uh, then to our blessed Lord, we'll, we'll, have, uh, we'll have great profit from this trial. Amen, appreciate it, Father. Yeah, before we go, can you get a final blessing? Yes, certainly, certainly. Accept benedictio Dei omnipotentis. Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, de Shemat Super, Vos, et Maniat Semper. Amen.